That's kind of a quick trip through atherosclerosis, but I'm sure most of you uh, are pretty familiar with the reaction to injury therapy. This th uh, theory, there's a lot of cells involved, actually, if you think about it, and we know that platelets are involved in atherosclerosis. We know that monocytes and macrophages are involved. Even, um, even uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells are involved with cytokines, so a lot of actors. To my knowledge, neutrophils are not involved in the atherosclerotic process. Atherosclerosis, as you probably remember, is a primary factor uh, for certain diseases. For example, coronary artery disease, mainly it's because of atherosclerosis we get trauma. Stroke, atherosclerotic stroke relates to atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, we'll find uh, very shortly abdominal aortic aneurysm is purely an atherosclerosis problem with weakening of the vessel. Um, uh, Non-traumatic amputation of lower extremity, peripheral vascular disease is predominantly an atherosclerosis problem. Okay, so atherosclerosis is prominent in many, many serious diseases. Uh, mesenteric angina, a small bowel infarction, uh, oftentimes has an atherosclerosis component. Renal vascular hypertension, atherosclerotic plaque at the beginning of the renal artery. So lots and lots of things for this terrible thing called atherosclerosis. Remember, it only involves muscular arteries and elastic arteries. All right. Now, can small vessels like arterioles get hardened? Yes. I would like you, please, to look at the screen, especially that, the one on the left. These are arterioles. They are not normal. This is called hyaline arteriolosclerosis. This one is, that looks like an onion uh, cut in cross-section is called hyperplastic arteriolosclerosis. Okay. Now, you better know about this dude over here. Would you all agree that the lumen is very narrow? Say yes, okay? Certainly when you compare it to that one. <laughs> okay, look at that one. Whenever we have lots of pink staining stuff in some tissue, we always use the term hyaline. That's just a term that we, are, we always use for that. Now, guys, hyaline arterial sclerosis is incredibly important because it's a small vessel disease. Look at everybody watching everybody. Look at all these ADDers. I mean, God almighty. You're doing pretty good now. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're looking at the small vessel disease of diabetes and hypertension. Is that important? Is that perk your interest? Well, not really. Well, it should because you're talking about two big time uh, terrible diseases, diabetes and hypertension. And they produce this kind of small vessel disease with the different mechanisms. And diabetes, it's by what is called non-enzymatic that means no enzymes are involved. Glycosylization. Ooh, I never heard of that term. Yes, you have. Ever hear of hemoglobin A1C? You ever hear of glycosylated hemoglobin? You ever hear of that? Same thing. So you need to know what glycosylization is. Glycosylization is glucose attaching to amino acids in protein. In terms of hemoglobin A, it's glucose attaching to amino acids and hemoglobin A. That means it gets glycosylated when glucose attaches to those amino acids. And as you know, uh, hemoglobin A1C levels correlate with six to eight weeks of what your blood glucose levels were. So it's the absolute best way of seeing long-term glucose management. And you want you below 6% if you're a diabetic because that means that you're in a normal glucose range. See, all the damage due to, due to diabetes is purely related to glucose, nothing else. Nothing else. There's nothing unique about diabetes other than a high glucose level. You keep that normal, it's as if you don't have diabetes. Because the only two pathologic processes are this, non-enzymatic glycosylization of small blood vessels, including capillaries in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, kidney, and uh, osmotic damage. Okay, so those tissues that contain aldose reductase, uh, lens, uh, pericytes in the retina, Schwann cells, they have aldose reductase. They can convert glucose into sorbitol, and sorbitol is osmotically active, sucks water into it, and those cells die. So you get cataracts. You get microaneurysms in the eye because the pericytes are destroyed, so they're weakened, so the retinal vessels get aneurysms, and you get peripheral neuropathies because your Schwann cells are destroyed. That's it. Those are the only two mechanisms for pathology in diabetes, and they all relate to excess glucose. So, tight glucose control, normal life, no problems at all, because the whole thing relates to high glucose. Okay, 
So what does non-enzymatic glycosylization do to the basement membrane of these small vessels? It renders them permeable to protein. So the protein in the plasma kind of leaks through the basement membrane and it goes into the, into the vessel wall and produces this hyaline change and narrows that lumen. That's all it is. So what if it did this to um, that non-enzymatic glycosylization of the glomerular basement membrane? Just think about that. What would that do to that basement membrane? Well, what did it do to this basement membrane? Rendered it permeable to what? Protein. So what if you rendered the glomerular basement membrane permeable to protein? What would you have in your urine? Protein. Might that be called microalbuminuria? Isn't that the first change that one sees of diabetic nephropathy? A little bit, trace amounts of albumin in your urine that shouldn't be there? Am I right or not? So what do you think the mechanism of that is? Say it. Non-enzymatic glycosylization. Okay, so you can see how important that process is. And Dr. Hansen will mention that glycosylization thing again, so that just reinforces it again. Now, hypertension doesn't use that system for producing this disease. It just uses brute force. It just drives, because of the increase in diastolic pressures, it just drives the proteins right through the basement membrane into there and produces that effect. When we look at a kidney and hypertension, a couple slides up the road here. Uh, it's shrunken. It's kind of got this cobblestoned appearance on the surface. And the reason why it's shrunken and has this, this kind of cobblestone surface is because they have hyaline arteriolosclerosis of the little arterioles in the cortex, ischemia, and basically it's just wasting away with fibrosis and atrophy of tissue. So it has a significant component uh, to the pathology of hypertension. Uh, lacunar strokes. Those are the little tiny areas of infarction that occur in the internal capsule area. is a hyaline arteriolosclerosis problem related to hypertension. So much of the pathology of hypertension and diabetes relates to that stinking disease. Must know. Must know. Now, this one is not all that common. Hyperplastic arteriolosclerosis. We see this with malignant hypertension. More common in blacks and whites, mainly because hypertension is more common in blacks and whites. This is when you get 240 over 160 blood pressures. You, go, you almost stroke out. You get papilledema, okay, that whole bit, okay. This is the kind of vessel changes that you see in the kidney in something like that. So that's about all this one's important for. Mainly it's the vessel disease that we see in malignant hypertension. And that's all on those small vessels. Okay, let's go into something a little bit more interesting. Look at it, please. What do you see? I see... Oh, what do I see? You see two, you see two kidneys, you see an aorta, and you see the bifurcation, and you see this big old aneurysm there. That's what you see. Okay, we're talking about aneurysms now, guys. Let's define an aneurysm. Let's make some analogies here so that we can integrate this. An aneurysm technically, is an area of outpouching of a vessel due to weakening of the vessel wall. So weakening, outpouching, aneurysm. Now, what's weakening the vessel wall, causing it to outpouch here? Atherosclerosis. We'll see why. Okay? Now, I'm going to make an analogy here for you and see if you're with me on this. The concept of aneurysm. Weakening, outpouching. What would be the analogous lesion in the lungs, weakening, outpouching, bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis would be, and it's due to usually cystic fibrosis with infection, destruction of the elastic tissue, and you get outpouching, dilatation of the bronchi. Bronchiectasis, similar concept to an aneurysm in a vessel. Now, this one's easy. You all should get this one. What is the GI, gastrointestinal, quote, aneurysm? Diverticular disease. In a diverticular disease, you have a weakening and then an outpouching of mucosa and submucosa through the area of weakening. It's a concept, guys. It's a concept. Weakening, outpatching. This is how you should think, trying to correlate things together. That is a law of Laplace. Ooh, we've got a physiology concept here. That says that wall stress increases as radius increases. Now, you know what that means in terms of this? Do you have any idea what this means? It means that once you start dilating it, it doesn't stop. 
because as you dilate something and increase the radius, that increases wall stress, it just keeps on getting. So in other words, all aneurysms will rupture. It's just a matter of when. That's the law of Laplace. It's the law of Laplace. So there's your correlation. Now, why, do they, why is this the most common location for aneurysms? Answer, there's no vasovasorum or blood supply to the aorta below the renal arteries. That's interesting. So that means this poor abdominal aorta can only get oxygen and nutrients from the blood that's in its lumen. So who gets screwed? The perfar part furthest from it. So because of the fact that it really is not getting as much oxygen and nutrients, it would be a little bit more susceptible to injury atherosclerosis, weakening of the wall, aneurysm. Very interesting. Dogs have base of visceral below the aorta, uh, below the renal arteries. They never get aneurysms down there. We do because we don't. That's an interesting fact. I defy you to find that in Robbins. Why? It's not there. Okay. New England Journal has the best article on this, and this is all you have to know. The most common thing is rupture. Okay, there they, um, in this article, they actually gave a rupture triad. Better listen to it. It's cross side like this. Sudden onset of severe left flank pain. Why? The aorta is retroperitoneal. And so the bleed is not into the peritoneal cavity. It's into the retroperitoneal tissue. So you get left flank pain, hypotension, because you can put 25% of your blood supply in your retroperitoneum and pulsatile mass on physical exam. Those three things equals rupture, abdominal, aortic, aneurysm, and you'll see all three in the stem of the question. Part two deals with, you know, when do you electively remove them, what, what, what uh, sonometers and all that kind of crap, not part one. So the, the most common complication of, an an, of, the, of any vessel aneurysm actually is rupture. Okay, now here's another aneurysm of the arch of the aorta. Now, this is coming back now. It went away for a while. Now it's coming back because the most common cause of this is tertiary syphilis. Now, did you know, did your microbiology people tell you that the pathology of syphilis is vasculitis? Ooh. Of what? Arterioles. The chancre, too? Uh-huh. I don't believe it. Sure. Why is it painless chancre? Well, if you do a section right underneath that, that shank, you're going to see little arterioles surrounded by plasma cells. That's the characteristic cell. And the lumen of the vessel is totally shut. So it's ischemic necrosis. And so in other words, it's ischemia of the overlying tissue, and it undergoes necrosis. And because nerves are right next to vessels, knocks them off too, it's painless. All of syphilis is a vasculitis. All of it. That's what the treponeme infects. Small vessels, arterioles. We think they're infecting in the arch of the aorta, the vase of the sorum. The richest supply of vase of the sorum is in the arch. So it's logical that the treponemes would pick it. And so what happens is you get what they call endotoritis obliterans. Ooh, that's a pretty cool term. Uh, in other words, they're obliterating the lumen. Okay? Ischemia, weakening, under systolic pressures. <laughs> Looks like a catcher's mitt. In fact, you could use it as a catcher's mitt. Looks like you can catch a hardball in there. Oh, that's what that was. That's right. That's what we're talking about, an aneurysm. There it is right there. That's the depression. Okay? This goes in a ways. What's that going to do to the aortic valve ring, please? Stretch it. And so what murmur are you going to get? Aortic regurgitation. All right. Very good. Now, notice that murmurs can occur because you can have valvular damage, or murmurs can occur because the valve ring that they're on is stretched. Okay, so you can have stretching of the ring and have nothing wrong with the valves and have a murmur. We can have damage to the valves and have a murmur. Okay, so this is an example of stretching of the aortic valve ring producing a, a, a murmur of aortic regurgitation. Why don't you just figure this? The aorta should be closing in diastole, isn't that right? So you pump the blood out, and since the stroke volume goes out, because the aortic valve here can't close properly, some of the blood's going to drip back in. Agreed? So you're going to have more volume of blood in your left ventricle in someone with aortic regurgitation? Yes or no? Is Frank and Starling going to be working? Sure. Remember, as you stretch cardiac muscle, you increase the force of contraction. So normally, you, uh, 
You have 120 mLs of blood in the left ventricle, and you get out 80 normally. Okay, so the ejection fraction is 80 over 120.66. But let's say you have 200 mLs of blood in here because of the blood dripping back in. Let's say Frank and Starling get together and say, one, two, three. You can just see them talking to each other. Whoa, boom. They got out 100. But remember, they started with 200. So actually, it's not all that efficient, is it? Because a normal person gets out 80 from what with 120. 0.66 ejection fraction. This is 100, and he started with 200.50. So I think you get the fact that Frank and Starling is not a normal physiologic process. It occurs in a pathologic condition. Well, you get 100 mLs of blood coming out of your out of your aorta, guys. Your head's going to be going like this, and that's not someone agreeing with everything you say. In fact, you can open their mouth and see the uvula pulsating. You can take their, their nail and lift it up, and you'll still see pulsation of the vessels underneath there. You can put a stethoscope over the femoral artery, press down, Duracell sign. You feel their pulse, and they have water hammer pulse. All those things that you learn in physical diagnosis. That's because of the increased stroke volume coming out related to the fact that there's more blood in the left ventricle. And this is one of the classic ones that does that. That's uh, syphilitic aneurysms in the aorta. Also, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve goes around this, the arch. It stretches it, and you get hoarseness. So there's an anatomy correlation for you as well. Most common complication, rupture. That must be a mess, huh? <whistles> this is the best picture of syphilitic aortitis right here. Okay. So there's an aneurysm for you, too. This is a dissecting aortic aneurysm. Okay. These are two picks here that are holding open some uh, important things. Mayo Clinic Proceedings has the best article on dissections. Uh, they're the experts on dissecting aortic aneurysms. In fact, I, when I lectured on this two weeks ago to one of my students in my second year class, who happens to be uh, uh, one of those uh, ambulance drivers, EMSA, doing that on the side, and lo and behold, she diagnosed a dissecting aortic aneurysm after I had lectured on it, and all the doctors in the hospital missed it, okay, because she, she just listened to what I had said, and she made the diagnosis, and, and that patient's alive now only because she recognized it, and, and the other people did not. That's cool. Now, what did the article say? The article said that the key factor for causing a tear in the aorta is hypertension, because it imposes stress on the wall of the vessel. But obviously, it's got to be more than that. There has to be weakening going on in the vessel. What, what is weakening the elastic artery? Answer, elastic tissue fragmentation. The elastic tissue is fragmenting. That's not good for an elastic artery because that weakens it automatically. Plus, there's uh, what is called cystic medial necrosis. That's kind of where the glycosaminoglycans in there kind of, kind of mix together and it kind of get this muciny kind of crap in there, little cystic pockets. That's not too cool either. In a sense, you can almost see the, the walls of the aorta kind of rubbing on itself and the middle is kind of like nothing in there. Fragmented elastic tissue. And you can just picture with a little bit of hypertension, just tears. Okay? This is where the tear was in this person. This is the aortic valves. The tear is right over here, right near the arch vessels. And so what happens is, wherever the area of weakness is in the artery, in the elastic artery, is the blood will dissect. In this particular patient, you can see that it wasn't distally. You can see that it went in there and went forward proximally, because you can see this is the outside of the aorta. That's the lining of the aorta. Right in here is the blood. It went from here like this. Whoa! What's this thing, Mark, where the pericardial sac attaches? So where did that blood go, please? In the heart, how do you think the person died? Cardiac tamponade. This is called a proximal dissection, which happens to be the most common one. Because of the fact that most of the tears are up in the air of the arch vessels, do you think, do you think maybe you might have an absent uh, pulse? Sure. Very, very common in a dissection that's proximal when that dissects is to close off the lumen to the uh, subclavian artery, usually on the left, and you have an absent pulse. Very, very commonly seen with a dissection. Now, guys, do you get the impression that the chest pain is going to be distinctly different from this than with a myocardial infarction? Do you think you're going to have substernal chest pain, radiation down the left arm and into the jaw? Oh, no. You're going to have a tearing pain. You're going to have retrosternal pain. It's going to be a tearing pain. It's going to go right into the back. Totally different location. That's what the young lady remembered. 
when she asked this guy that was complaining of chest pain that she went to for on a 911. This guy was complaining of chest pain here and it went into the back. No, you sure not down the arm? No, no, it's right here and it's just, it's, it, what does it feel like? It's, it's like tearing, actually is the term. It's going to my back. So what a medic can say, this is deception. And she felt the pulse on the left was diminished versus the one on the right. Whoa! Okay, but she had to drop the, the kid, the guy off at the emergency room, go out to another one. And so she checked back about a couple hours later, and they're still scratching their stupid heads down there. And they say, I don't, we don't know, because the uh, troponin ones and all that are all negative, and EKG's not showing any signs of acute changes. We don't know. How about a dissection? <laughs> so then they got a chest x-ray, widening of the aortic knob. Diagnosis, aortic dissection, a, a, a dissecting aortic aneurysm. Because, you know, but blood in here, okay, excess blood in here, you do a chest x-ray, the diameter of the proximal aorta is going to be expanded. And the Mayo Clinic said that's 85% sensitive, and that's a screening test of choice. Just do a plain old chest x-ray, and you'll see widening of the proximal aortic knob, they call it, widening. With that history, dissection. Then to prove it, you do a transesophageal ultrasound, or you can do angi angiography to, di to make you confirm your diagnosis. Okay. Now, a lot of diseases can predispose to dissections, and one of the classic ones is this. What's this patient have? Marfan's, okay? You're seeing here unicoid proportions. That's where the height from the, uh, from the pelvic brim to the feet is greater than the pelvic brim to the head. Also, another definition is the arm span is greater than the height. I think you can see this guy had an appendectomy. If it was, it was a blind surgeon, okay? <laughs> This patient already had a, his operation for its dissection. Now, you know that in Marfan's, which is autosomal dominant, chromosome 15, defect in fibrillin, which is the, uh, the, the uh, component in elastic tissue, fibrillin's defective. And so elastic tissue is weak. That's why they have dislocated lenses, and that's why they, they have dissecting aortic aneurysms. It's not the most common cause of death, actually. Uh, even a little bit more common is mitral valve prolapse. They all have mitral valve prolapse and even tricuspid valve prolapse, and they go into uh, sudden death. They get some conduction defects. That's even a little bit more common than dissections. Okay, so Marfan's is a common cause of this. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome because of defects in collagen. It's the most common cause of death there. Um, Pregnancy, in fact, a, a type part two question is, what's the most common catastrophic disease in pregnancy of the aorta? The answer is dissecting aortic aneurysm. Reason why is that if you're pregnant, you have twice the plasma volume as a pregnant woman than you did when you're non-pregnant. You increase plasma volume by two, red blood cell mass by one. So if it's a two to one ratio of increasing plasma volume to RBC mass, wouldn't that decrease your hemoglobin concentration? Yes, that's why all pregnant women have, you use 11.5 as the cutoff point for anemia. Normal uh, for a non-pregnant woman is 12.5. In pregnancy, it usually goes to about 11.5 because of the dilutional effect of the excess in plasma volume. That can apparently, that excess volume for nine months in some women can cause weakening and you get a dissection related to it. So those are some of the causes of dissections. I can literally guarantee that 75% or more of you will have a dissection question and you will have no problem in getting it right. Okay, now this guy was a, uh, a smoker, developed the primary lung cancer. He's now complaining of headache and blurry vision. So you look at his retina, and he has retinal vein engorgement, okay, and you can see that he's congested all the way uh, from here on up. Diagnosis, please, superior vena cable syndrome. Okay, this is usually due to primary lung cancer, knocking off the superior vena cava, and so you get the backup of venous blood uh, into the uh, jugular system, into the dural sinuses. This is a very, very bad disease. Actually, this patient will die. They usually treat him with radiation to shrink down the amount of tumor so they can get some good blood flow in here. The reason I actually put this up here is that I want you to confuse superior vena cable syndrome with Pancos tumor, which we'll talk about when we go over lung. That's Pancos tumor is the one that's associated with the Horner syndrome. So superior vena cable syndrome is just knocking off the superior vena cable, nothing to do with Horner's, and as opposed to the Pancos. That's why I put, put this here rather than with the respiratory. I'm skipping over a few things. I think you all know what, what, what uh, saponous uh, um, 
with Varicose veins look like, so I'm not going to be boring you with stuff like that. You can deal with that on your own. I'm hitting the key stuff for you. All right, let's do some vascular things. What a nice little conglomerate of things here, okay? A little conglomerate of things, especially since every one of these has been on boards. It even becomes even more interesting conglomerate, including that little baby was on boards. Okay, who can tell me? Who's the, who's the physical diagnostician here? Who can tell me what disease this patient has? Sturgy Weber syndrome. Okay, and they love this because you can see it's a, actually a vascular malformation uh, in the face. Notice it's in a trigeminal nerve distribution. That's what makes it easy. Okay, but what's, what's going on in the same side of his brain? Well, he's got an AV malformation there. And so that's the tie-in they want you to know. Not only is it a vascular malformation of the face, but on that same side, you have an AV malformation, which uh, predisposes to bleeding. Okay? Also, these patients are a little bit mentally retarded. Very common. You go to any mall, you'll see some people with variations of this, maybe just a little bit up here. This guy's got it pretty bad, almost the entire side of the face. This is the Oslo Weber Rondu showing some of the... Uh, the small phalangiectasia in the GI tract. And I showed you the finger with it as well. So that's another one. What, if I press this in right over here, these, these little tentacles would go away. What is it, please? Spider angioma. Is it ever normal? Say yes. Who's it normal in? Pregnant women. So what does it do to? Hyperestrinism. What if I had a spider angioma? What would that mean? I'm probably at cirrhosis. And what's the most common cause of cirrhosis? Alcohol. Now, why would I have a spider angioma? Is it because I enjoyed spiders, which I do? I study them. I think they're more very fascinating creatures. Actually, the first invertebrate that actually uh, uh, nurses their young. They carry them on their back. Of course, if they fall off, they eat them. But you know that you know whatever. It's, it's a nice gesture to carry them, at least I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, whatever. Uh, why would I have them? Because if I have cirrhosis, I can't metabolize estrogen. So it builds up, I'm going to get gynecomastia, I'm going to have warm skin, palmar erythema, right? And I'm going to have spider angiomas related to hyperestrinism. There's another reason too, and that is I can't metabolize 17 keto steroids either, therefore I'm going to aromatize those in my adipose into estrogen. So there's two ways you get hyperestrinism in cirrhosis. So how does this differ from a petechia? Well, it looks different for one, but if I press that in, this would blanch because it's an arterial venous uh, fistula. In other words, you're going from arterial directly to a venial and you're bypassing capillaries. That's what these are. Okay. Here's, uh, this is the truth. This is the truth. A couple of years ago, okay, just put this up here. I said on the boards... If they show you a picture of a child that looks like this with a red lesion here, of course, most of you thought there was bilateral white eye reflex there and forgot that this is what we're talking about. That's flesh over there. That's not a bilateral white eye. This kid does not have retinoblastoma, just in case you were wondering. I said, they, they show you a kid with a red lesion on the face. I'll bet you they're going to say, A, surgically remove, and then look at E, and it'll say, leave it alone. That's right. And guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? The test that those kids took at this picture, and guess what A was? Surgically remove it, and guess what E was? Leave it alone. I got so many calls on that. I said, did you know that was on the test? That's the exact picture, and A was what you said it was, and E was what you said it was. <laughs> Just half of the guess. <laughs> Why? Because they want you to leave it alone, because by eight years of age, that'll be totally gone. The capillary mangiomas, leave them alone. Don't fiddle with them. Don't, don't try to disfigure the poor kid's face. They'll do fine. That is the cutest little mouth I've ever seen. Look at that. It looks like a heart. Look at it. It looks like a heart. I love babies. I am the absolute best poppy in the world. Okay? I have three of them hanging off me at once, and I take them all out, and my, my, my daughter trusts me with them. <laughs> okay? And we do things that I probably don't usually tell her. You know, we, I believe in manly things for little dudes to do. They're all boys. <laughs> Strength has a lot to do with their development. I guess I'm hanging from my fingers. Oh, good. That's good. That's good. You know. What if they drop? They drop. Okay, that's part of life. <laughs> <laughs> they are real tough. They are real tough. I have one of that they do on a swing. 
And I'd hold up a stick. I'm in front of them. They're on the swing, and they, they go on their bellies on the swing. They push up, and the object is to grab the stick and hold on to it. Okay? So there's my little five-year-old. He goes, all right, one hand. And he's smiling at me, and I'm looking down. Then I put it up here. Then I put my three-year-old. He does it. Okay? He's smiling away. He did it. His big brother did it. He did it. Now the uh, two-month-old can't do that yet. <laughs> little sucker just looks at me with a smile all the time. <laughs> but I'm still holding him upside down and all kinds of stuff. Testing him out, getting him ready for power. <laughs> My little Ostie, the five-year-old Superman. Little Deli, three-year-old. He's Batman. I'm Power Ranger. And I have to be of the black color because the other one's red and the other one's yellow. I'm black. And it's just fighting all the time, wrestling and this. And I said, Power Ranger's going to be Batman and Superman. You guys are nothing compared to black. Oh, that just gets them going. That just gets them going. And I just made believe they annihilate me. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, they kicked me and they pound on me. Ah. They love it. I love babies. It's just when they're teenagers, out, out, out. Let's get the next little kid for me, please. <laughs> Scroll to teenagers. <laughs> All right, you saw this already. What's this? Coppice sarcoma organism. Purpose virus 8. Now I'm going to tell you the one that's going to be on your boards. Well, this will be, there is a lesion only seen in AIDS patients that looks like coppice, but it's due to a bacteria. Bacillary angiomatosis, and what's the organism? Bartonella hensleyi. And how do you see it? Silver stain. Guaranteed on your boards. Because it looks like coppice, but isn't. And you can treat it with a sulfur drug and it goes away. It really looks just like it, and only seen in AIDS patients. Bacillary angiomatosis, Bartonella Hensley, it's also the cause of cat scratch disease. It's also the cause of cat scratch disease. This is an angiosarcoma of the liver, guys, and for some reason they ask this very consistently. I have a mnemonic for it, VAT, V-A-T, vinyl chloride. It's a common cause of this. Arsenic, that's the A, and T, thorotract. They don't usually ask that. This is angiosarcoma of the liver. Vinyl chloride is present in work, people that work with plastics and rubber, and so they run the risk of developing this. Of course, arsenic uh, is a part of pesticides. You know, when you do your dip your dogs and stuff, there's uh, arsenic is in there, and of course, it contaminates water supplies. So if I had to remember anything, I'd remember vinyl chloride and arsenic for angiosarcoma of the liver. All right, vasculitis. Here we go. Let's give you the concepts first. Why do I do this? Because the stem of the question gives the answer away. I wish I could get that across to students. They don't ask physical diagnosis questions. They put it in the stem. So if you know physical diagnosis, you get it right. If you know lab medicine, they give you the answer when they put the lab data down. Okay? So they give away the answer. All right? And so, and so I want you to understand the vasculitis concept, because there's vasculitis of small vessels, and you already know what those are, arterioles, venules, capillaries. There's vasculitis of muscular arteries, and there's vasculitis of elastic arteries. And trust me, they don't have the same signs and symptoms, just like platelet disorders had different signs and symptoms from coagulation disorders. And if you remember what I taught you on those two things, there is no way in God's green earth you're going to get a platelet question wrong or a coagulation factor question wrong, because all those things that I just taught you will be in the stem of the question. All right. When you have small vessel vasculitis, I will tell you this. 99% of the time, it's type 3 hypersensitivity, which means it involves immune complex deposition. That will deposit in the small vessel, activate complements, C5A attracts neutrophils, and you get fibrinoid necrosis and damage to that small vessel. And you will have, listen... Palpable purpura. Palpable purpura. Now, remember that back of the hand of the old person? Was that palpable? No. That was just hemorrhage into the skin. There was no inflammatory problem with that. It just ruptured into the skin. It's not palpable. 
But if it was palpable, then it would have been a vasculitis, not a platelet problem, a vasculitis, a small vessel vasculitis. You might have heard this in, uh, in your medical schools, leukocytoplastic, vasculitis, nuclear dust, all that crap, whatever it is. It's, they have fibrinoid necrosis, and they're all immune complex diseases. Small vessel vasculitis, palpable purpose. They tell you that in the stem of the question. Muscular artery, you get a vasculitis law of that, let's say polyarteritis, nodosa, wagonous, granulomatosis. I think it should be clear that you're going to get a thrombosis of the vessel. You're not going to get palpable purpura. You're going to have an infarction. Take Kawasaki's disease in children. They get a coronary artery vasculitis. In fact, the most common cause of a coronary, of a myocardial infarction in children is Kawasaki's disease because part of the syndrome, in addition to the mucocutaneous inflammation and desquamation of skin and lip adenopathy, is coronary artery vasculitis. And what happens is you get a thrombosis and a poor little dude's got an infarction. So infarction is what you see with muscular artery vasculitis, like polyarteritis nodosa, Wagner's granulomatosis, Kawasaki's disease in kids. Now, when you knock off an elastic artery, then you start dealing with arch vessels and you get pulseless disease. That's Takayashu's arteritis. Because the vasculitis will block off the lumen of, let's say, uh, one of the arch vessels. You'll get strokes because it maybe could knock off part of your internal carotid. Are you getting the idea that these are totally different? Palpable purpura is what? Small vessel vasculitis. Infarctions is what? Muscular vasculitis. Uh, and loss of a pulse or a stroke is what? Elastic artery. And one that you really want to remember there is Takayashu's arteritis, the young, uh, East, far eastern young lady with an absent pulse. Takayashu's arteritis. Good. Now let's go through some of these suckers here. Do you get the idea that this guy's got a headache right there? <laughs> okay. Did you just get that idea? No, I just think maybe he's just thinking. No, no, I don't think he's just thinking. Because this is coming in, he says, it hurts right here, Doc. And guess what, Doctor? I can't see out of this eye. Okay, and Doctor, I'm here. i got aches and pains all over my body. Okay? And when I chew, it hurts. Where does it hurt? Right here. What is it? Temporal arteritis. Okay? It's a granulomatous. See the, you, can see the, you can see the multinucleated giant cell. You see multinucleated giant cell. What do you say? Granulomatous. Vasculitis of the temporal artery. And it can involve other portions of the artery, including the ophthalmic branch, and produce blindness. That's why the sedimentation rate, the only indication, according to the internal medicine literature, for a sedimentation rate, the only one, is to screen for temporal arteritis. That was on their boards. Why? It's not that it's specific for this, but if this is an arteritis, an inflammation, the sed rate should be elevated. If it was not, then you better be thinking of something like a transient ischemic attack or some other thing. It ain't to temporal arteritis. So it's just purely a screen. Why? Because it takes time to take a biopsy of this and look for these things, and the patient could go blind. So you have to put them on corticosteroids right there and then, just on history alone. Otherwise, they can go blind. And they'll be on it for a year, I might add. Now, part two hones in, not on the temporal arteritis, but the polymyalgia rheumatica, the muscle aches and pains, okay, which is commonly associated with this as well. And they try to get you to say it's polymyositis when it isn't. Polymyalgia rheumatica, there's no elevation of serum CK. It's just you have aches and pains in muscles and joints. Whereas polymyositis is natural inflammation of muscle. You have an elevated CK. That's freebie. Part two question. Okay. Temporal arteritis. What do you think this patient did? Smoked. Okay, this is what? Werger's disease, otherwise known as thromboangiitis obliterans. Smoker's disease. Usually males, young, they get digital vessel thrombosis. And they get auto infarction of their fingers and toes. Now they always say that you know the disease goes away if you stop smoking. I don't think that's going to go away. You know, I got my, my second years to believe when I showed him this slide. I said there was a case down the block at the clinic, so they knew what the clinic was. I said there was a guy that has this disease. He says, oh, 
That is true. That was true. And it said, and he came into the clinic down there the, to uh, one of your third-year uh, classmates, okay, with a complaint that he said it's part of his finger was missing. And they're looking at me because they know I play tricks on him, but I just, I did this straight face. He said part of his finger was missing. He had most of his fingers were already missing, and guess what he was doing? He was smoking through it. But one part you could clearly see had, had broken off. And uh, and they said, well, where is it? You know, the, the third year student, where, where is your finger? I don't know where it is. But the, but the student noticed that the patient was having a little trouble breathing out of the right nostril. Okay? And so the student has, was saying to himself, no, no, that couldn't be. But because they went to my class and all that stuff, and they were taught to, to, to look in every, every, everywhere because physical diagnosis is just decided to just take a look and see it just if that way, you know. So I looked in there, and, and guess what they found? They were all like this. All of them, every, all 89 of them. I said, yes. Took a tweezer, and what do you think came out? The finger. <laughs> then I was rolling all over the front, literally rolling all over the place. Oh, they didn't trust me from that point on. Uh, they did not trust me from that point on. They just said, no, we don't believe you. Okay. They actually, I got all of them, 89 of them. They're like, oh. <laughs> but they, it's possible, though. I mean, if that's something, you put that in your nose and you're really digging for the big one, it's possible that that could happen, actually. I don't think he was all that far-fetched, personally. I do not. <clears throat> Moral of the story is, stuffy nose, look for amputated finger. Okay, a uh, 14-year-old boy, upper respiratory infection one week ago, presents with polyarthritis, joint pains, hematuria with RBC casts, and palpable purpura of the buttocks and lower extremity diagnosis. Hanoch, Schoenlein's purpura, the most common vasculitis in children. See, the palpable purpure gave it away. It's interesting. It's only located in the buttocks, as uh, Tom Hanks would say in, uh, in that movie, uh, and legs. Uh, henna, it's an immune complex, as are all uh, small vessel vasculitides. It's an IgA, anti-IgA immune complex. And the RBC cast is glomerulonephritis. Most people think that IgA glomerulonephritis, called Berger's disease, not to be confused with Werger's disease, and henoxtrenalized purpura are the same thing. Okay, so this is very, very common, henoxtrenalized purpura. And it got about an 85 to 90 percent chance, a good many of you will have that question. Very, very common, or that picture. But they will tell you that this is palpable because you know you can't, you can't feel these things when they're on a picture, you see. That's non-palpable, see. But it would be palpable. All right, here's a patient with saddle nose deformity and it ain't congenital syphilis. This patient also has problems with sinus infections, problems with upper respiratory uh, uh, problems, also lung problems with, uh, with these nodular masses and also even a rip roaring glomerular disease. What's your diagnosis? Wagoner's granulomatosis. That's actually the most common cause of a saddle nose deformity in the United States. It's a granulomatous inflammation and vasculitis. So it involves the upper airways, it involves the lungs, and it involves the kidneys, and there's an antibody that's associated with it that's highly, highly specific, C. anca. That's anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody is associated with this uh, why, the way you're going to remember that is, what's the treatment of choice for it? Cyclophosphamide. What letter does that begin with, please? C. What letter does C anchor begin with? C. Very good. C, C. All right. So that's how you can remember that. And what are the dangers of cyclophosphamide? Hemorrhagic cystitis and bladder cancer. And how are you going to prevent the uh, hemorrhagic cystitis? Mesna. M-E-S-N-A. Okay. Um, I don't have a picture of polyarteritis nodosis, so I usually mention it in relationship to this. Polyarteritis nodosis is a male-dominant disease. It involves muscular arteries, so you know infarction is part of this thing. And it also has an anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody, but it's p anchor, which is nice and easy to remember, polyarteritis p anchor. 
The only real important one uh, thing that you want to remember about polyautoritis nodosa, other than that antibody, is its association with hepatitis B surface antigenemia. Very high association. That's what they hone in on for polyautoritis. How would I ask it on board? Simple. I'd say I have an IV drug abuser with chronic hepatitis B who has a nodular inflamed mass uh, on the lower extremity and a hematuria. Okay, that would be the kidney infarct. And I'll say, you know, what does the patient have? That's polyautoritis nodosa. Why? Because I already said the patient had chronic hepatitis B. So there's your surface antigen thing. And then we, I dealt with a, uh, some vascular problems, some glomerular, nephri glomerular problem, and that would be polyautoritis nodosa. So remember that. P. anchor, polyautoritis, hepatitis B surface antigen, and you got it made. Okay, this is just the vessel in Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Remember, rickettsial organisms infect endothelial cells. Remember, in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the uh, spots are, in fact, petechia. Okay? And remember, unlike other rickettsial diseases with rash, this starts on the extremities and goes to the trunk, whereas the other ones go from the trunk and go to the extremities. And you also have to remember what vector caused this. Tick. Can you name a couple other tick-borne diseases? How about Lyme's disease? That's Borrelia recurrentis, right? No one's challenging me. What are you, all dead? It's Borrelia burgdorferi. What's Borrelia recurrentis? Relapsing fever has antigenic shifts, so it can shift in terms of its antigenicity. Is it a spirochete, yes or no? Yes. Is leptospira a spirochete? Yes. Is syphilis? A spira, yes. That's another board question, knowing what the spirochetes are. Leptospira, Borrelia, and uh, treponema, pallidum, and all the other treponemes. Okay, this is a, uh, a fungus. It's wide-angled, non-septate. This is a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. It has cerebral abscess related to uh, this fungus. Diagnosis, mucormycosis. Do not forget the relationship of mucormycosis with diabetic ketoacidosis. You see, diabetics commonly have mucor at, in their frontal sinuses. So when they go into ketoacidosis and you have all that glucose and stuff, they start proliferating and go right through the cribriform plate and they invade the frontal lobes, they infarct it and, and, and infect it uh, with disease. So mucor is a big time one to remember for with deep diabetic ketoacidosis. What's this patient have? Raynaud's phenomenon. Now, many, many things can do this, guys. It's not just one disease. It's like hundreds of them, actually. So the concept I want to give you is different class of, different causes of this. Now, some of them involve cold-reacting antibodies and cold-reacting globulins. I've already mentioned those already. And those people are going to have that relationship with going outside in cold weather and getting rainouts and cyanosis in the nose and ears, and they come in and it goes away. I mean, that is clear cut. So the answer to that one's either going to be some kind of IgM cold agglutinin disease or cryoglobulinemia in an old man with hepatitis what? B or C? C. Very good. That's wonderful. All AD people always get that right. Because they have, that's very good. Why? A, B, C. That's why. It's amazing. Okay. However, what are you laughing about? <laughs> we have some other diseases that are autocollagen vascular where the first manifestation of them is Raynaud's. This involves a digital vasculitis and eventually a fibrosis. Who am I? Progressive systemic sclerosis, otherwise known as scleroderma, and its counterpart, Crest syndrome. Crest toothpaste, Crest syndrome, a little bit of a variation of scleroderma. And the first manifestation is Raynaud's, but it's a different mechanism. It's an actual vasculitis of the digit. And eventually, it'll fibrose. And remember that finger and that, kid, that guy with the smokers? You auto-amputate your fingers. Let's go through Crest syndrome. I have two things for C. One is calcinosis, that's dystrophic calcification. The other C, I want you to remember, is centromere antibody. The centromere antibody is specific for Crest syndrome. So it's good, two good things to remember with C. Of course, that's not in books. I made that up. What's R? Raynaud's. What's E? 
esophageal dysmotility problems. With S, sclerodactyl, that's a finger that looks like you stuck it in a, in a pencil sharpener. It's a nice and narrow finger. What's T? Phalangiectasia. Very similar to those little pinpoint areas of hemorrhage that you saw with Oscar Weber Rondu. Always asked, guys. Always asked. Okay, now other causes are just due to vasoconstriction. It's common in people that have migraine headaches that take uh, Cafriga types of drugs because migraines are due to dilatation of vessels and the medications you take could constrict them. Okay, and sometimes you can get Raynaud's phenomenon after taking ergot derivatives uh, uh, as well. Breger's disease can also have Raynaud's associated as well. So vasoconstriction is one group of things that can do it. Uh, vasculitis of the digit is another one. That would be scleroderma, uh, crest syndrome, and um, cold reacting antibodies and globulins is another group of diseases that can do this. They like Raynaud's. This exact picture has been on many, many, many tests. Hypertension is a very nice little conglomerate of things that kind of tell, show you actually the main organs that hypertension affects. And then I did it in sequence, too. The most common cause of death in hypertension is a myocardial infarction. Second is stroke. Third is renal failure. So let's talk about hypertension, most commonly essential hypertension. What racial group has the highest incidence of hypertension? The black population. Now, it's, it's obviously, if that's true, there must be some kind of genetic thing, but it ain't Mendelian. What is it? Multi factorial inheritance. Another name, polygenic inheritance. Okay. That's what it is. Gout's multifactorial inheritance. When you ask people if they have a family history of a coronary artery disease, they say yes, coronary artery disease is multifactorial. Type 2 diabetes is multifactorial inheritance. I said gout already. Uh, <laughs> affective disorders, the kind, did you have fatum? Fatum, teach me. Affective disorders, multifactorial. Congenital pyloric stenosis, multifactorial inheritance. Essential hypertension, multifactorial inheritance. Now, you know what that means? That means you have a tendency for, but not don't necessarily get disease. Because it said it's multifactorial. Okay? So, if I was black, and I had this history in my family, what would I do to prevent me from getting it? Okay, now I can't change my genetics. My genetics are, I can't get rid of salt in my urine. Okay, I'm retaining too much salt. That's the basic mechanism of essential hypertension in the black population. I also might add the uh, adult, old people. I just can't get rid of salt. We'll go through why, why you get hypertension with that. Well, I can't control that, but I sure can control two things. One is my weight, because I know there's a direct correlation with my weight and hypertension, so I'd make sure that I was... Uh, we're nice, lean, and mean, okay? And secondly, I can reduce my salt intake, okay? I could do that too, right? And I can exercise. Those things would reduce my risk for developing hypertension because those are the, the other factors that could produce the disease. Take gout. If I have a family history of gout, what could I do so that I don't get a gouty arthritis? Well, I'd want to make sure I don't eat no red meats whatsoever, drink absolutely no alcohol because that would keep my purine metabolism down, and I wouldn't end up having to worry about getting gout. So I might have the genetics, but I could do things to prevent me. If I, type, if I had a family history of diabetes type 2, what would I do? Oh, I'd make sure my weight was, I would be lean and mean. I would have not one, one speck of adipose on me. Okay, because as you, as you lose adipose, you upregulate insulin receptor synthesis, and that alone could prevent you from getting the disease. So that's the good news about having multifactorial inheritance. There are some things you can do that will decrease the chance that you can get that. Let's go through the mechanism of why you get hypertension because you retain salt. Now, this isn't the only mechanism, but this is the most common one. When you retain salt, what compartment is that salt going to be retained in? ECF. Okay. So, if that's true, then what would be the plasma volume if you had excess salt in your vascular and interstitial compartment? Increased. If your plasma volume's increased, then what's, what's your stroke volume have to be? Increased. So there's your systolic hypertension right there. It relates to increase in plasma volume. Now, maybe you learned this, maybe you didn't. When you have excess salt, salt likes to go into smooth muscle cells. Where? Peripheral resistance arterioles. 
Now you know that when sodium enters muscle, it opens up certain channels for who to go in. Calcium. So calcium goes in, and what does it do to the smooth muscle down there? Contract. So what's happening to the peripheral resistance arterioles? They're, they're decreased, they're in vasoconstriction. Total peripheral resistance equals viscosity to radius to the fourth power. We're decreasing the radius, increasing peripheral resistance. Are we keeping more blood in our arterial system in diastole while our heart is filling up? And, uh, what, no, are we, uh, are, we, are we retaining more blood in our arterial system? Yes or no? That registers as an increase in diastolic pressure. See, this is why the treatment of choice for essential hypertension in blacks and old people is hydrochlorothiazide. Because you get rid of salt and water, and that's basically, you drop the blood pressure by doing that. Okay. Only problem is, if you have a hyperlipidemia, then you don't choose that. Can't use beta blockers, can't use thiazides. If you have a hyperlipidemia, because those drugs can produce that. So you'd have to go to an ACE inhibitor or something like that. Is it a high renin type of hypertension or a low renin hypertension? That's another board question. Low renin, because you have increased plasma volume, that's, uh, that's increased blood flow to renal artery, decreased renin. Very good. Very good. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism of most causes of hypertension. Okay, in terms of complications, most commonly, um, myocardial infarction, in fact, is one of the major risk factors for coronary artery disease is hypertension. Okay, so that shouldn't surprise you. It's the most common cause of death. The next one, stroke, and remember this picture. We'll see it again when we do CNS on Friday. Where is that blood located? It's in that globus pallidus, cutamen area, right? That's where almost all hypertensive bleeds occur in the brain. And that's because the lenticulostriate vessels, which are small little branches from the middle cerebral artery, under increased pressure form aneurysms called Charcot-Bouchard aneurysms, and they rupture. Not a good place to rupture. So this is not an infarct. This is a hematoma. It's a blood clot right there. Not a good place to have a blood clot. Now, neurosurgeons now can go through silent areas of the brain and suck these out and improve the prognosis. Now, some people have more silent areas in their brain than others. Some people, they can just go anywhere they want, and it doesn't affect them in one iota. But whatever, they can do that. So that's your second most common cause of death, a hypertensive bleed. And this is that kidney I told you about. Does that look normal to you? Say no. Now, you can't tell whether it's too small, but it is. But you certainly can tell that that's not a normal surface. It's very kind of like, like pebbly. Okay? Why was it like that? Tell me why. Tell me why. Hyaline, finish it. Arteriolosclerosis, that small vessel disease, is causing ischemia in that kidney atrophy of tubules, destruction of glomeruli, the kidneys are shrinking, and you go into renal failure eventually. That's the third most common cause of death in hypertension. What's the most common overall abnormality in hypertension? Left ventricular hypertrophy. Mechanism, please. Is it a preload problem or an afterload problem? Afterloads. Having to contract against an increased resistance, left ventricular hypertrophy, and if it's there long enough, what happens to you? Heart failure. Good. I think that's enough for this morning.